Hi everybody, welcome to Mark's 900, I'm Mark. Right, today we're going to delve under the seat of this Z900 and look at a few of the features under there. Now, that's a bit more exciting than it sounds because, first of all, I'm going to need some help from you guys on one or two points. Um, secondly, we're going to have a look at some of the things to watch out for. We're going to dive into the um, onboard diagnostics, the engine ECU, or as far as we can. And we're also going to look at some of the hidden gems that are under there. So, not quite as boring as it might sound. Now, first thing I need to do though is get these seats off. So I'm going to have to remove these SW Motex saddlebags or rear panniers. Now I'll put these on a little while ago. I've already done two videos on it, so I'm not going to labour the point. But what I will say is, since I've had these on, um, I've barely taken them off. They've been absolutely brilliant. I mean, it doesn't change the riding experience at all, except that you've now got somewhere to put all my stuff. So that's brilliant. So they just uh, they come off pretty easily. And also, I've been using this underneath just to protect the paintwork on the bike. I'm not sure I really need it, but all this is is um, a, an old inflatable sofa, which I chopped up, and it's a sort of flock material, so slightly fluffy material, which goes against the paintwork and stops it rubbing. So there we go, that's those off, that was easy enough. And the next thing we're gonna do is take this rear seat off, we're gonna work our way from the back and have a look at all these features as we move forward. Now I've got to tell you guys, removing this rear seat can sometimes be an absolute work of art. Now if I was an engineer, I would have invented a system here where you put the key in, you turn it, and you get a positive clunk as the rear pillion seat unlocks. However, on this, you chuck the key in and it, it kind of doesn't want to turn very easily and it feels like you're going to break the key. It's really awkward. Um, if you put a bit of pressure on the seat and turn it, no. Nope. Just see what I mean? I mean that should just be easy, shouldn't it? There it is, so that's clicked and that's open, so now I can take the rear seat off. Now, interestingly, putting the rear seat on is um, equally as difficult. So what you need to do is hook the back underneath, push it down, and it should just click into place, but sometimes it doesn't. Now, for those of you that remember the 1970s and the Fonz, you know, happy days, well, this is what you need to do. Hey. Right then, as I grapple to get this um, rear seat back off, I will just say that I think a lot of these bikes have got similar sort of quirks. Now, I've certainly had a few bikes where it's been quite difficult to get these seats on and off. And I've got a mate of mine with an Africa Twin. Now, we took his seat off once to put it on a lower setting so that I could ride it. And um, if you can work out the seat on an Africa Twin, I think you can pretty much do anything. So uh, let's get this rear seat off and just have a quick look under here. Right, now that we've got that rear pillion seat off, let's have a look at what I've got underneath. And this is where you guys come in, because what I'd like to know is, what do you carry in this limited carrying space that we've got in the Z900? Or any other bike for that matter, I think they're all pretty similar. So what I've got is um, hexi drives in one of these sort of multi-tool type sort of things, because uh, that fits pretty much every bolt on here. Um, I've got some glue, the, the old bacon strips, and then these... Um, tools which you use for tyre repair so if I get caught with a puncture at least I've got some fighting chance of being able to fix it not that I've ever used them but that's uh, going to be the subject of another video now other things that I've got under here is a little um, plastic spanner which I use to tighten up the uh, things on my GoPro when I'm out filming so that's quite useful just to keep there and then the whole lot's kept in place by a piece of plastic which I've cut to shape and I keep down there inside because it stops things like um, these metal things from sliding through and uh, arcing across the battery or doing something stupid. I mean I can see the toolkit down there, there's not a lot of space for things to get through but it just gives me a peace of mind that things aren't going to slide down into the battery bay and as I say do something stupid. So that's what I keep in there, not a lot of space for anything else. Now sometimes I take those hexi uh, keys out and I put in place a lock. So I've got always carry my puncture repair kit, but sometimes I put a lock in there as well. Either that one, that big monster lock, or that one. But I don't know about you guys, I find that I never leave my bike anywhere that I need to lock it up. It's either in work, or it's in my garage, which is where I do lock it. Um, if I'm out anywhere, it's normally just parked outside a cafe where I'm watching it. So I don't tend to use these an awful lot. Uh, maybe when I'm off on tour, but then they go in the bags. So that is generally what I carry uh, in the back there. So what do you guys carry? Be interested to know. Right, just one other quick thing before we uh, move on. Underneath this rear seat, uh, I've noticed there's a little bit of corrosion around these uh, nuts and bolts here, so that needs to be cleaned up and greased. And also these staples are just steel staples and they've gone a little bit rusty around there, so I'm gonna clean, clean those up as well. And water does get under here a little bit, so uh, I think the whole thing just needs a bit of a tidy up. So that's just something to watch out for. 
Um, also, there's a little bit of surface rust, which is in here. Uh, so I think I'm just gonna clean that up. Just get a whole lot looking good. So definitely worth having a peek under there if you haven't looked for a while, because it does get a bit dirty, especially after the old winter season. Right, let's move on, get under the seat. Okay, let's whip this seat off then. And uh, this is far easier than it is to take the um, rear seat off. So that was it, the, uh, the seat's held in with these two things that go into the rubber bungs there, and that holds it all in place. Um, so you lift that up and the seat comes straight off. Things to note with this, once again, they use steel staples here, so these tend to go a little bit rusty. I'll keep them greased up with a bit of silicon grease. Um, apart from that, it's fairly clean. Now, once we're underneath, I can point out the things that I know about. So uh, first of all, you've got a couple of fuses there. So we've got the um, ABS fuse and a spare, and there's the uh, signal indi uh, indicator type fuse, and that's also got a spare with it as well. This thing here is the relay that I put in for the uh, indicators, that's not the Kawasaki relay, that's one that I swapped out because I've got these small rear indicators on, but that again is on the um, video all about the fit in the panniers. Not entirely sure what that is, I've never had to mess around with it. Data tag stuff under there, I'm guessing the ECU's under there as well. Um, but I wanna focus in on the battery because there's a couple of things to note about this that I, one of them I've literally just noticed now. Right, the reason I want to look closely under here is mainly because of this negative terminal on the battery. Now, like most negative terminals on batteries, these tend to be um, just left uncovered, unlike the positive one, which has got a cover on it. As a result, they're kind of open to the elements, they get water on them, and they're made of materials that corrode. And of course, there's batteries involved here, charging, sort of acid, and um, various gases that come off it when you do the charging. So these things, can rust or at least corrode quite quickly and this one did it went really rusty so I cleaned it all up and then I um, I've greased it up and I've used silicon grease on this as well I think lithium grease is what's recommended but um, that one looks uh, quite nice now but it didn't before it was a right mess right the other thing which I've just noticed uh, around this negative terminal is because I hosed the bike off last night when I came in I came back from quite a mucky commute and um, gave it a hose down like I normally do and I've noticed that I've got water all around this negative terminal. You can see it in there, I'm sure. And when I move the battery, I can see a bit down at the back as well. So clearly water does get in underneath that seat. You need to be a little bit careful of that. And it pulls there because there's nowhere for it to go while the bike's on the side stand. Not sure that's really a design fault as such, but um, just be careful when you're getting your water uh, or at least your hose pipe from spraying the bike down because you don't want too much of that going on. Right, let's look at some other features under here. Right now, this next bit is where it gets a little bit more exciting because what we're going to do is dive into the onboard diagnostics. Okay, so at the back of the bike, there's these two sockets that look like they're plugged into something, but they're not. They just kind of hang there with this bit of foam around them. So you take the foam off, don't lose it. I'll put it in the back there. And we've got these two connectors. And also there's like a sort of socket for a bullet connector that goes in there. I'm not entirely sure what that is. So again, you guys, can you tell me what that's for? I've got no idea. But we have got these two connectors. Now... Back in the early days of having this bike, um, I got the engine management light came on twice and it was a starting issue where I think something was a little bit sticky in the throttle body and the bike's supposed to rev higher when you turn the engine on when it's cold, but just for a split second it wasn't because it was a little bit sticky. And so we get an engine management light. Now, Euro 5 regulations state that once you've got an engine management light, it has to stay on until you've reset it. So, um, <clears throat> that cost me £30 each time, I had to take it to Kawasaki, got the whole bulls acre doing that. So I decided that if I could get into that um, engine management system, the onboard diagnostics, then I could reset the light. Now I've done this loads of times with a car, and I use one of these little gizmos, uh, which is, uh, this one's called a car doctor, they come in different shapes and sizes, and you plug them into the standard OBD port on a car, you can reset the engine management light. However, with a bike it's completely different. Now to explain why, I'm just going to give you the potted history of the onboard diagnostics OBD and uh, OBD2 standards, which is now um, on bikes and cars that are uh, Euro compliant. So let's go through that. I'm going to go for a ride while I explain it, and then we'll come back and I'll show you exactly how I plugged into the bike. All right then, me and a couple of my mates are going to ride up a road called Fish Hill, which is in Gloucestershire. It goes up to a place called Broadway Tower. Now, um, I'm going to overtake my mates. We're on the intercom, and they're just telling me to go and overtake because this is my idea to ride up this road. Now, Fish Hill is famous around these parts because it's a long, winding road that goes uphill. It's got some fantastic bends on it. So today, halfway up this hill, they've got um, a professional photographer who's taking pictures of the bikes coming past, and then you go onto the website. It's called bikerpics.co.uk. So looking forward to seeing the results of that, and me being the vain one in 
in the group it was my idea to go up here hence me going to the front right anyway back to the obd2 and what i really wanted to do was give you the complete history of the onboard diagnostics protocol but once i started to do some research i found that it's an incredibly complex topic there's whole websites dedicated to this and there's youtube channels that put videos up that last for hours on end talking purely about this set of protocols so what i'm going to do is give you the bits that i think are important and help me finally get into the bike's diagnostics functions after many months of trying. So the onboard diagnostics or OBD is a term relating to the vehicle's self-diagnostic and reporting capability actually first introduced to cars in the late 1960s with OBD version 1 that did little more than illuminate a bulb that was often referred to as the idiot light because it gave no other information it just lit up. Now there was no real fixed standard and car manufacturers implemented their own proprietary systems and as the standard started to develop no two makes did the same thing. Now, it wasn't until the 1990s that OBD version 2 came along and the good news, at least for cars, is that the output connector is a standard 16 pin. The signalling protocols are all standard and the error codes, if not standard, do at least follow a pattern. So it's a letter that signifies the system within the car that has the problem, so for example P is the powertrain, and then four numbers which also follows a standard. This means you can use a single connector and a single app or one of those code readers that you can buy and you can see what's wrong with any vehicle and check things like the emissions. Motorcycles from European and American brands manufactured from 2016 onwards are generally OBD2 compliant. However, the presentation of the port is far from standard with manufacturers using different types of ports. Well, that was until Euro 5 came along. So did Euro 5 actually do something good? Well, it looks like it did because we now have a standard connector block on motorbikes for onboard diagnostics and a standard set of parameters that can easily be displayed so that a bike can be tested for Euro 5 emissions. It always comes back to those emissions, doesn't it? Anyway, it feels like newish bikes have settled on a set of standards, but those of you with older bikes, well, I've been reading an awful lot about ODB2 and how it's been implemented across the various manufacturers, and I'm sorry, but you're just going to have to do your own homework on this. It's a massive topic. Back to my bike, which I'm glad to say is a 2020 Euro 5 Ready Z900, and whilst things didn't go well to start with, now that I've got a better understanding of that standard, I have finally, after many months of trying, managed to get into the bike's ECU, I can see error codes, I can reset error codes and I can get lots of other supplementary information about the bike. So let me show you where I was going wrong and how I eventually managed to get in. Okay, let me explain the drama I've had trying to connect to this bike then. So I went on to Amazon and I ordered one of these leads. Now, this is a lead which connects a Z900, that end, up to a standard OBD um, port outlet. And then from there, I can put my in-car doctor thing and shove it on the end and that will emit a Wi-Fi signal which I can then connect to with my phone, have a look at the ECU and reset the engine management light. Easy enough, that thing would plug straight into there. You can tell that because the caps are the same colour and indeed that does fit. That's a six pin connector that goes onto there. It's pretty standard, it's been used for years. Now that did work to a point because it powered this thing up and it did send out a Wi-Fi signal that I could connect to. However, I could not get into the ECU on the, on the bike. I just tried everything. I tried loads of different apps on the phone, but I could not do it. So I've been sort of mulling over this one for quite some time. In fact, months and months I've been thinking about it and I just couldn't work it out. And then I realised that actually the reason is, wasn't anything clever. I thought perhaps um, Kawasaki encrypt their technology in, in their computers or uh, something like that. But no, what it is, more simply, is that I'm using the wrong lead and it's not that port that you connect to. So got myself back onto Amazon and I got one of these. This is called a Euro 5 connector. Now again, it's six pins, but completely different form factor. And that one plugs into there. And once that's plugged into there, and I've got my car doctor on the end of it, I can now connect to this with my phone and look at the computer on the bike. So let's have a look at that now. Right then, so here we are with the bike running and you can see that we've got the lead plugged in to the correct port in the back of the bike, the little red connector there, and we've got the Wi-Fi module on the end of the lead. So that's sending out a Wi-Fi signal, which is called Wi-Fi underscore OBD2, connected to it on the phone, 
And now I'm going to fire up the first app. Now this first app is called Talk Light. It seems to be the one that's highly recommended by most people. So just click a few OK buttons there. And then once we're in, we can scroll through and we can see that there's a number of different displays. And whilst we look at one of those displays, we can see it's fairly blank. And then as it starts to read the information from the bike, up it pops with a bunch of information. Some of it useful, some of it not. To be honest, most of it is the stuff you can see on the dashboard anyway. Now the app itself is highly configurable. You can get lots of different displays you can add them you can do them at different sizes and so on depending on what you want to look at there we can see more information popping up all the time about what's going on in the bike it's actually worth saying at this point that you can't really do anything with this app that's going to damage your bike you might be able to reset some logs and get rid of some fault codes that are probably going to come back but you're not going to hurt the bike and you can buy these widgets that plug into the obd port that claim to increase performance or give better fuel economy but it's absolute rubbish now there is a cog down in the bottom left hand side and if we click on that cog what it does it brings us up the options to actually add more displays but also it's got things like fault codes and as you can see from the button I just pressed there there are no faults being recorded on this bike and to be fair there haven't been since the very early days with a few teething problems that I mentioned. Now let's look at the next app. This next one's called In Car Doctor. It's a bit more of a sort of text view of things rather than those rather nice little widgets. It's the one I've always used, if I'm honest with you, when I'm looking at cars. And again, it shows you the same information, just in a different format. So we can scroll through all those different bits. And once again, there is a section in there which gives us the ability to look at the diagnostics. It tells us if there are any fault codes, and then we can clear them down, get rid of them if we need to. But again, no fault codes on this bike, which is great news. Again, I've never actually had to use this, but it's always nice to know that I've got it if I do need it. Anyway, seat back on and let's get on with some other stuff. Right then, the last thing I want to talk about underneath the seat are these rubber bungs that sit here at the back. And these are the things that the seat sit into and it holds it in place. Now you've got two options with these because there is a, um, a small part and a larger part. So if you have the larger part upwards, it tilts the seat forward slightly uh, and gives you a slightly more aggressive seating position or you can have them that way and that will sit the seat flatter. I guess it also makes it a little bit more waterproof. Um, now I have mine that way up and uh, it's interesting I don't really notice the difference if I'm honest and I don't know if that is supposed to be an intended feature of this Kawasaki so really interested again to see what you guys think about that. Did you know about these and have you messed around with them? Genuinely, I don't find an awful lot of difference, but I'd like to think that it's there as a feature to give me a choice. Okay, that's me about done. I'm gonna get this cleaned up under here, grease all the bits that I need to, get it all back together. And then the bike's in for a 15,000 mile service, where I'm also gonna get the chain and sprockets replaced as well. And then I'll be doing a 15,000 mile review. So I'll see you in that video. Um, keep your chains oiled and I'll see you then. So um, for those of you that remember the 70s, here's a top tip for you. You've just got to do a Fonz. Oh, fuck off.